Okay, let's review and wrap up this series of Worship is War. In our first lesson, we talked about Revelation chapter 4 and worship. John was given this glimpse of worship in the presence of Almighty God around his throne. John's dying. He's in a lonely, secluded place. But what he sees lifts him while instructing us. In our second edition, we talked about King Hezekiah and Sennacherib and how Hezekiah used worship to overcome the enemy of Israel. And today, we're going to finish the series by talking about a story concerning King Jehoshaphat and what he did to overcome overwhelming odds. Learning to be in the presence of our God is our highest honor. And may I say, it's our safest haven from our foes. Jehoshaphat understood the war principle. We are told in 2 Chronicles 20 that he was in a dreadful situation. The text reads, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Munites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom and from the other side of the sea. It is already in En Gedi. These armies were at war with Judah. Look at the map. You'll see En Gedi. And then if you go to the north, west a little bit, you will see the city of Jerusalem. They're that close to Jerusalem. They're that close to striking on the capital of Israel. So what did the king do? We know exactly, because we can read verses 3 through 12. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of Yahweh, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from Yahweh. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of Yahweh in front of the new courtyard. And this is what he said. O oh, Yahweh, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, do not judge them. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Worship lifts our eyes to God. Worship is acknowledging the sovereignty of God and applying it to our crisis. Of course, the key verse is verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. These are honest words that we can pray. So the prophet delivers God's answer in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 15. He says, listen, King Jehoshaphat, 
and to all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what Yahweh says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Wow, how many times have you seen this phrase in a picture or a slide or a poster? The battle is not ours, it's yours, God. Well, the people responded to God's answer in 2 Chronicles 20, 18 and 19 and 21 and 22. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before Yahweh. Then some of the Levites stood up and they praised Yahweh, the God of Israel, with very loud voice. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to Yahweh and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, Give thanks to Yahweh, for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, Yahweh set up ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. And they were defeated. You see, God arranged it that these enemy forces would turn on one another and destroy themselves. But note the progression the threat, there's worship, and then engaging the enemy while worshiping. God intervenes then, which leads to the victory. The king's first line of defense was worship. You need some hope? You remember the words of Romans 15, 4? For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Old Testament is a picture album of learning tools that we can apply in our lives in Christ. And we're not fighting the Moabites or the Assyrians, but we're fighting the spirit behind these evil forces, according to Ephesians 6 and verse 12. This idea is picked up again in Revelation. In Revelation 17 and verse 12, it reads, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. War didn't end in the Old Testament. It's just as real today as it was then. We must see this. The devil's mission is to stop the light. The Jews were to be a light unto the nations, according to Isaiah 49 and verse 6, but they stumbled. Jesus says, now we are a light on the hill, Matthew 5. And the evil one will do what it takes to snuff out that light. Why? Because the light exposes him and his evil deeds of darkness. The devil's mission is to wreck our witness, to restrict us, to rob us of our hope. How's he doing? Well, there's more. Second Chronicles 20, beginning at verse 24. Let me paraphrase a little bit of this. By the time the army of Judah came on the scene, all they saw were dead bodies. No one escaped. Not one enemy soldier. So the Israelites began to carry away all the plunder, and there was so much of it. It took them three days to get it all. So on the fourth day, they assembled, and they decided to have a praise service. Now pick it up at verse 28. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of Yahweh with harps and lutes and trumpets. And the fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how Yahweh had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace. For his God had given him rest on every side. Ah, there's the peace we want. But it's after the war. 
Oh, here's the deal. We can absolutely do what Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat did. They worshipped. Instead of surrendering to their foes, they surrendered to Almighty God. Let there be no mistake. This is wartime. The evil one is throwing all he has against us. Political unrest, pandemic, unparalleled immorality, and crushing debt. Our response must be our witness of worship. Think of Hannah. What did she do? He worshipped God in her barrenness. David worshipped God when he lost his infant son. Daniel worshipped God and was thrown into a den of lions, but where angels were as well. Job loses it all, but he worships. We are called to this war, but we are not without the weapons to win. The Psalter says it this way in Psalm 95, 6. Oh, come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker. Worship is war. Because any time we openly declare our love and allegiance to God, we are raising a battle cry of defiance to his enemy. Father, we're not looking for a fight, nor do we desire the stress of conflict, but we will defend your honor and your territory and your light because your glory is our highest priority. Father, we love these stories of faith and godly intervention. Help us to find application in our daily struggles with the spirit of Moab and Ammon. We'll keep singing as we trust you will keep setting up the ambushes. Confuse our enemies in the midst of our praises to you. You're a one awesome God. The only God, and yes, yes, our eyes are upon you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.